good morning. How are you today? How good to be together in the house of the Lord. I'm going to invite you to stand. And it feels like fall, doesn't it? There's sunshine, but it feels like fall. From Psalm 89, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. And then verse five, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. And so as we worship in song this morning, let us proclaim the faithfulness of the Lord and join in with all of creation that is declaring his praise. Are you with me? Let's sing together to our God.
He's the hope for the world. He's the hope for us all. So would you join us? Join me in singing. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on, we sing. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the morning you may have a seat and if you are between grades five and grade seven j57 you are dismissed to go to room 206 i hear it's going to be exciting hmm. if you have a kid and you're in this room kids were already dismissed at the top of the service so you're welcome to head out to kids shine and if you don't know where that is you can ask someone either here or at the top of the kiosk thanks Awesome. Thanks, team, and uh, thanks for being here. Welcome to our service, and today is a, actually an important day for our community uh, together as a church and specifically for Pastor Jeff as we together as a community and as a denomination recognize God's call on his life for full-time Christian ministry. Uh, this is called ordination. And some of you are thinking, well, it's a good thing we're recognizing this because he's been doing it for 11 or 12 years now. So, um, yes, we are here doing this now, and uh, today it's my pleasure uh, to welcome our new district superintendent for the Alliance of BC here. Uh, Mark Peters is here together with his wife Naomi, and uh, he has been a pastor at our uh, Alliance churches for like 23 years. Uh, this past year, uh, the churches in BC elected him as the district superintendent to give oversight to all of our churches in BC, which I am thrilled about because Mark is uh, a humble, godly leader who thinks well and really wants to serve the churches and see God's kingdom come in our churches and in our cities here in BC. So let's welcome Mark, and he is going to lead us through Jeff's ordination. Thank you, Scott. I can honestly say that is the nicest thing that Scott has ever said about me before. That's true. 
Scott and my love language to one another is typically sarcasm, so wow, thank you, Scott. It is a delight to be with you on the occasion of Jeff Stewart's ordination. And so as, as Scott has said, Jeff has been involved in this process for a while, but what's involved in the process is, is reading and reflection, the writing of lengthy theological papers, the submission of sermons that are subsequently evaluated by a committee of peers, and Jeff has been going through this process over the last number of years, and all of this work culminated in a final intensive oral examination in which Jeff's call to ministry, his ability to articulate Bible and theology was tested. And I can safely say that in the history of, of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, particularly in the Canadian Pacific District, there has never before been an ordinand who was interviewed while on holidays in Las Vegas. Jeff just likes to kick it up a notch. Ordination is defi as defined by the Christian Missionary Alliance is the affirmation of the local church that the one being ordained has been set apart by Jesus Christ and gifted by the Holy Spirit for gospel ministry. And so, Jeff, over these last years, it's been your calling and gifts that have been affirmed by your lead pastor and by the board of elders as Jeff has been going through the process with the denomination. The denomination has also affirmed your gifts and calling, and today, here formally, I recognize your gift and calling as well. And so this morning, I would like to offer a few words of encouragement to you, Jeff, based on 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Jeff, I am so grateful to God for you, for your ministry here at Peace Portal, and for your ministry to youth pastors spread all throughout the Canadian Pacific District. And on a day when we're speaking about gifts and calling, I want to exhort you to continue your ministry with the end in mind. Most of us live with an obsession about the now. Where do I go? What should I do? Say or decide. And while we do reflect on the past from time to time, typically, we reflect in terms of how it will affect the all-consuming now. And I'm asking you, Jeff, and people of God here at Peace Portal Alliance to live differently. Consider the Apostle Paul. He was facing execution as he penned these words, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. As pastors, Jeff, we want to get to the end of our ministries and be able to proclaim these very same words with absolute integrity. And so, Jeff, I have three questions for you this morning. One, what are you fighting against? Two, what are you running towards? And three, what is it that you're keeping? What are we fighting against? I can tell you that we are not fight fighting against specific people who don't agree with the Bible's perspective of God, humanity, or the world. They are not the enemy. Paul tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against principalities, authorities, and powers of this dark world, and against all the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Jeff, every time that you point to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and creator of all, you're fighting the good fight. Every time that you speak the truth, or walk in righteousness, or extend the gospel of peace, you're engaged in the fight. And the fight that Paul describes has less to do with winning over anyone, and it has more to do 
with aligning our words, our actions, and our character with Jesus, because Jesus is heaven's champion. What race are we running? Friends, are we not all running towards the Lord Jesus himself? Paul says that everything else can be considered a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing and experiencing Christ. And so, Jeff, while pastoral ministry is about teaching Christ and leading like Christ and bringing others to Christ, primarily it is a journey with Jesus Christ. In effect, as pastors, all that we do is we say to the people all around us, come with me as I follow Jesus. And so, Jeff, make Jesus the great pursuit of your life. He is the destination to which all of the cosmos is moving, even now. And finally, what is it that we've been called to keep? I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. But by using this word, faith, Paul is saying more than simply, I believe in Jesus, in who he is and what he's done. Paul isn't primarily talking about intellectual assent to a kind of creedal statement. Keeping the faith is about so much more. He's making a sweeping statement about how what he believes has shaped the entire trajectory of his life. He's in jail, remember, knowing that the cost for following Jesus is going to be a martyr's death. Elsewhere, Paul writes, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Paul did keep the faith right till the very end, remaining true to Jesus. And so, Jeff, it's with this end in mind that we live in the now. We fight the good fight. We finish the race. We keep the faith. Jeff, you've been called to the role of pastor, and my confidence is that everyone who God calls, he also equips and empowers. And, Jeff, I'm praying that you would know the love of God in ever-deepening ways. And that you and your entire family would know the provision of God for life and for godliness. And, Jeff, may God strengthen you to preach the word, to correct, to rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And so at this time, I'm going to invite Jeff to come and join me on stage. Scott, could you come as well? And if any of the elders board is here this morning, can you also come and join me on stage? We're going to lay hands on Jeff, and we're going to pray a prayer of commissioning and blessing over him. And so as the elders come, if you're physically able, can I invite you to stand? And as we pray for the Holy Spirit's blessing and gifting and empowering presence upon Jeff, can I invite you just to extend a hand? And so, Father, we are joining today corporately in your delight in Jeff. We thank you for your calling, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence in Jeff's life and the gifts that have emerged and will continue to emerge. May you continue to be at work in Jeff and through Jeff to bring honor to Jesus and blessing to the nations. We pray Jesus, that your wisdom, your courage, your faithfulness, your love would be resident and growing in Jeff and Levon, in their family. And we thank you for this passion for the lost that Jeff not only knows, but practices everywhere he goes. Thank you, Lord, for their backyard that has become a gathering point for the neighborhood, for dog walkers and watching movies and Lord, we see your love at work in and through Jeff. And so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, together corporately, we bless Jeff and agree that he is called to gospel ministry. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I've just asked Jeff to say a brief word back to the congregation um, in this significant day for him. Brief. Good luck. Um, (laughs) You can grab a seat. You can grab a seat. Um, 
One, I just want to say thank you. When I walked into the doors of this place in 1998, uh, if you're new here, welcome, because I was new here. In 1998, I walked in, I got welcomed, I, I learned about Jesus and what he did for me, I became a Christian, and in the fall of 2000, I volunteered to help out with some grade 8 students, and 23 falls later, I'm still working with youth at this church. Um, we have been through a lot of life here. I met my wife, LaVon. We started going here. Uh, we uh, became, we got married. We became parents in this church. We became uh, parents to two kids, Jack and Winnie. And throughout that, you have remained prayerful, kind, generous. But I think what blows me away more than anything is that in ministry, it can be challenging and difficult. And there's so many high highs and mountaintops that you've celebrated with us. But in the valleys of life and of ministry, you've stood with us there too. And the way you've been generous with your love towards our family, to me personally, um, and supported us, it is immeasurable with the impact it's had on our lives. And so for a kid that didn't grow up in the church, uh, to be an ordained reverend is the weirdest thing possible. And you're probably thinking, he should have dressed up. Uh, but <laughs> this, if you've been here long enough, you know who you're getting. So... Um, <laughs> Thank you, and thanks from the bottom of my heart for the way that you've prayed and encouraged and loved us and our family, prayed for the ministry that's been going through here, and um, for every one of you that's listened to my stories or tried to keep up with the sermon, um, thank you, and may that God bless you and bless our church as we continue uh, on mission together. Awesome. And I, I don't really know what you're talking about, Jeff, because both you and I have collars on today. Like, we have dressed up. <laughs> Top, what's, yeah. Okay, we're going to move to the in the know for, in just a moment. Let me just give you two brief updates before uh, we do that. One, uh, I know many of you have been waiting to hear about Garth Baxter's memorial details. Uh, we can now confirm with you that it's taking place this Tuesday, September 20th at 1 p.m. here at the church. You know, many of you are connected to the Baxter family, and so let's continue to pray for them, and as you're able, let's join together to celebrate uh, Garth's amazing life. And also, just uh, for those of you who are curious, two weeks ago we gave us an announcement about one service versus two services, and we gave you different numbers and stuff like that. Some of you want to know the numbers. Let me tell you what they were. Last week, we had 675, 673 technically, adults in this room. And uh, we originally were forecasting, you know, once we got up to about 800, 830, we'd look at doing two services. We've adapted that a little bit based on the in intel we got last week. And so we're planning now our target or our trigger sort of number of adults in this room is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 725 to 750, okay? And that doesn't include kids who are in the children's wing right now. And so uh, we're going to wait and see what the numbers are for the next little while. And as I said, make that call uh, for a few weeks out to change back to two services. Um, but again, as a reminder, we actually can't do that if we don't have the necessary support structures uh, in the other areas. And so our Kids Shine ministry still needs people to volunteer. If you would be willing to do that even just one time a month, that would be like, we're almost done September, that would be like nine times in this next ministry year. If you're able to serve even one time a month, it would make a difference and it would help us get to the point where we could actually split into two services once again as attendance requires us to. So just a brief update on that, and uh, now let's watch the In the Know for the rest of the information. Hey everyone, welcome here. My name's Justin, and here's what you need to know. Hey, is there someone you can invite to Alpha? Alpha is a course that creates space for you to bring your spiritually curious friends for a conversation about life, faith, and Jesus. We'll enjoy dinner together, watch short videos pertaining to Christianity, and have time for open discussion. It all begins this Wednesday and runs for the next eight weeks at 6.15 p.m. Sign up online. 
Last week, we introduced an important ministry that helps you grow as a disciple and fosters meaningful relationships with others. Our small groups, now known as community groups, are starting up this month, and we would encourage you to get engaged in one. You can visit our YouTube channel to watch the video about our community groups and head to our website to connect into a group. Don't forget about three important ways to deepen your relationship with Jesus and his church. After the Sunday service on September 25th, you can attend one of three information lunches. Starting point. If you're new to Peace Portal and want to learn more about why we exist and what we're all about, this one's for you. If you follow Jesus and would like to learn more about taking the step of baptism to publicly declare your commitment to him, we invite you to join us for a baptism lunch. And if Peace Portal is your church community, we would invite you to join us at the membership lunch, where you can hear more about what it means to be an active, all-in participant in your church community. Please visit our website to register. If you are living with a diagnosed mental illness, or you are supporting someone who is, we invite you to Living Well, a peer support group meant to help you through the journey of mental health struggles. This group will meet alternating Wednesdays beginning September 21st. Please register online to attend. Come join us for Refugee Engagement Night as we hear from Journey Home what it means to become a community of welcome for refugees in our community. This night will create some clear ways we can get involved in the upcoming months. Join us on Monday, September 26th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in the cafe. The Bible is a compelling book. It is the living word of God to his people. Through it, people over centuries have met with the living God, heard him speak, and discovered his wisdom for their lives. But the truth is, it's not always an easy book to understand. We wonder, how did this book come to be? What do we do with some of the challenging and confusing parts of it? Can we trust it? And how do we meet Jesus in the midst of these texts? In the living word, reading the Bible and letting it read you, we will learn together how the Bible came to be, why we can trust it, how to read it well, and most importantly, how we experience Jesus in these texts. The Bible is still the living word of God, meant to speak to us and transform us. The Living Word course runs Tuesday evenings from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. starting on October 4th through to November 29th. Register online to attend. Hey, that's all that you need to know. Have a great week. No, oh, this in the know starring Justin Lenny. <laughs> Well, after a historic 70-year reign, many of us know this, Queen Elizabeth passed away and Charles became king. As a Commonwealth country, many of us actually are going to uh, have the day off tomorrow as we commemorate and remember and honor her life. Now, in a group this size, I know, and, and this diverse, I know that there's a lot of diversity of reaction to this news as well. Some of us actually will feel the impact and the loss of this uh, leader who seemed to be genuinely humble and wanted to serve others. Others of us might just simply be curious, how's the monarchy going to survive under Charles? Others of us maybe don't really have any reaction. The news has been everywhere, but it hasn't really touched us at all. Still others of us here may have some negative associations with the past actions of the British Empire in the country that you maybe grew up in, and so you're a bit conflicted or you have a bit of a angst as it relates to the monarchy as a whole. There is no doubt a number of different variety of reactions to this global news, but I suspect there's at least two commonalities, and the first is this. If you are a Canadian citizen or if you are part of a, a country that's part of the Commonwealth, you have a new king. That's, that's a fact. We have a new king. That is the reality of it all. Commonality number two is more of a guess, 
But I suspect that most of us would struggle to name any kind of tangible way that this new reality actually affects our life. And so this cultural moment that we are in is actually a little bit interesting because this is a significant event. It is a newsworthy event, and it's been a global news event, and yet it doesn't really impact us much at all. And I don't say that to be disrespectful in any way, but to simply point out that there is a significant difference between our current Canadian concept of king or kingship and the ancient Near East concept of king and kingship, which is when the book of Genesis was written. And that was the context in which it was written, the ancient Near East. And we're going to unpack some of those differences in just a few moments. But first, we're going to open up our Bibles, and we're going to try and understand how does the creation account reflect the reality that God, that Yahweh, is king. If you weren't here with us last week, we started a new series through the fall to Advent on God and His kingdom, the kingdom of God. And last week, I showed you this uh, one slide that described the macro macro story of God um, in six sort of acts, and it, it reflects this reality of beginning to end. This is all of human history and God's story, but reflected in these acts is this central idea of the kingdom of God. Some of you asked um, where, they could, where you could read more about this, and so I've put up the book. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but a, a theologian by the name of Craig Bartholomew has written a book um, a number of years ago now, but it's called The Drama of Scripture. He was one of the early voices in this sort of king and kingship uh, central theme of the Bible, and so that's there for your information if you want to pick that up. This morning, we're going to look briefly at that first act, creation, and we're going to try and spend uh, the next two or three weeks after that digging into Acts 2 and Acts 3. So, we're going to start at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where the author writes this, in the beginning, God, and that's as far as we're going to get for a moment. The opening words of our Scripture begin with God. Have you ever thought about this? Is it, there's no really introduction to our Bible. The author of the Bible, um, or of this text, sorry, of this text doesn't start with a philosophical rationale for the existence of God. Why? Well, because that wasn't up for grabs. That was an assumption back when this author was writing this narrative. There was no question about if there was a God. The only question that they were wrestling with was, of the gods that exist, which one is really the God? Of all the gods of the surrounding nations and every nation proclaiming their God to be the one true God, which one was it? Who was ultimately the most powerful? Which God truly called the shots? And the creation account is going to actually begin to answer that very question. And so, our Bible begins with this straightforward declaration that a supreme being exists. And then the rest of this book is going to tell us who this God is, what He's like, how He wants to relate to us, and how we are meant to relate to Him. And while there's lots of things that we could learn about who God is and about ourselves and about why the world is the way it is in the creation account itself, in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 in particular, today I'm going to attempt as best I can to limit myself to just speaking directly to how is God presented as king in this account And we can start by just recognizing one that's going to be really obvious for us. God is presented as king over creation because He is the one named as creating it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We exist. You exist. I exist. This earth exists. The cosmos exists because God wanted it to exist. And by His divine power, He spoke it into existence. 
Other New Testament passages are going to reflect on this reality that God not only created all things, He actually holds it all together. He sustains all of creation. And as such, we could just simply say, and I think we get this, as Creator, He has owner's rights. God is king because He's the Creator. That's the first and most obvious point of Genesis chapter 1. And I think it's assumed by many of us, but that was a radical declaration at the time of writing. And even more so, how the author of Genesis chooses to tell this creation story itself is actually declaring God as the one true God. We might miss it in our modern setting, but the ancient readers, they would not have missed it. They would have noticed these things. They would have noticed that chaos, which is one of the things they feared the most in the ancient Near East, chaos is not a place where life happens. Darkness is not a place where life happens. The ancient Near East writers would have recognized that chaos and darkness are dealt by God, uh, dealt with by God, who brings order to creation, who brings light by, again, just speaking it into existence. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 let there be light, and God's divine will is accomplished. Now, here's what's interesting. Verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1 tell us the way that God brought light into the darkness. He created the sun and the moon. And we read that, and we say, of course He did that, because we still see the sun and the moon. That's actually a very scientifically verifiable fact. But again, to the original writers or readers, that was actually not just a scientific fact. That was a bold theological statement. One of the earliest, most powerful Egyptian gods at that time was Ra, the sun god, who ruled over all of creation. Sound familiar? Nope, says the creation narrative, not Ra, Yahweh. In fact, the sun and the moon and the stars, all of which had various gods associated with them, they're all not gods. They're actually just part of the created order created by the one true God who is distinct from creation and yet created it all. Yahweh is the creator and the king. Perhaps even more shocking to these ancient readers would would be the rulers of the nations. The kings of the surrounding nations were viewed as either divine beings themselves, so in ancient Egypt uh, they were considered gods, or in Samaria they were considered human but superhumans, touched by the gods in a unique way to lead. But the author of Genesis makes this shocking claim that all humans, including kings, are again part of the created order, simply that. And in fact, they're made from dirt. Not very regal and noble and exalted, is it? A long ways away from being God. And not only that, equally surprising, every human being is made in God's image. And so these well-known verses in chapter 1, God said, let us make mankind or humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 8, we're told that God creates a special garden in Eden. Eden isn't the name of the garden. Eden is the region. And within the region of Eden, God creates a garden. And He puts the man that He formed in that garden. 
And if you've been with us for a little while, you would have heard most recently, I think it was Justin who was unpacking this a little bit, there's this temple imagery woven throughout the Genesis account. We, again, might not recognize it as modern readers. But in the ancient Near East, every temple had a garden in it. And within that garden, the image, the carved image, whether stone or wood, the carved image of that God would be placed there. And so here, humankind is made in God's image, not a God, but made in His image. He is placed in the garden overlooking the rest of Eden. And the author of the creation account is, yes, wanting to tell the story in such a way that we understand that there's this temple imagery. All of the earth is God's temple in these moments. It's the place where God and humankind were meant to be together and enjoy relationship with one another. Remember in chapter 3, when all things go to literally hell in a handbasket, it says that God was walking in the garden and they heard Him. So there is this temple imagery here, but there's not just temple imagery, there is also kingly imagery as well. Because guess who else had gardens in the Old Testament or in the ancient Near East? Like, it, it wasn't like today. Like, lots of you have nice gardens. You go into your backyard and you guys have beautiful gardens and I, it's beautiful and I can't grow any of that stuff. It wasn't like that back then. The temple had a garden and guess who else did? The king. The king had a garden. And we can see that actually even in our Old Testament. Various kings with gardens are named. And if we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and the creation of humankind and Adam and Eve, we see that the, the commissioning that they get by Yahweh is actually kingly. It's to rule. It's to order things in such a way, steward things in such a way, earth in such a way, that you represent me on earth. Some of you have heard the term vice-regent. That's the word that is given to Adam and Eve. And it's a word, uh, it's a title to describe a person who has been empowered to act on behalf of another sovereign. And so, how, does, how is God presented as king? Well, listen, this delegation of authority to Adam and Eve to steward and rule over the earth, it only makes sense if God is king right? Think about this. Let's say you work at a, a, a big company, and you're like a mid-level sort of management person. And you're doing your work one day, and one of your co-workers, another mid-level manager, walks up to you and says, hey, listen, Sally, I, I'd like you to kind of start thinking about the new direction that we want to take this company over the next couple years, and I just, I just want you to know you have my blessing to, to lead us in that direction. What would your response be? It'd probably be, I hope, thanks, Fred. I'm not sure you actually have the authority to give me that kind of authority. And you'd probably think um, Fred's getting a little bit delusional. How would that change if the chairman of the board of that company came and said, listen, Sally, I want you to start thinking about where to take this company in the future, and I, I and we, the board, are going to give you that authority. You'd take it a little bit more seriously, wouldn't you? Why? Because of the authority. And so we could say this, that the creation narrative, it doesn't explicitly declare God is king in such a way. It implies it. It subtly suggests it. It actually assumes it at times that God is king over all of creation, and therefore, He has every right to delegate His authority to Adam and Eve to steward creation. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know about all this, Scott. This, it, you're, you're getting out of what we like to sometimes, as evangelicals say, the plain reading of Scripture, and you're starting to make all these sorts of other assertions and wonderings. And uh, Are you overthinking this a little bit? Not if we put ourselves back into the mindset of the ancient Near East readers, which is what we have to do to correctly understand and interpret this ancient text. And not only that, we can actually be really confident in the fact 
that the ancient readers understood not only what the opening creation narrative said about God as king, but what the rest of the Pentateuch said about God as king. Because over and over again in Israel's worship uh, book or hymn book, there was these declarations that just understood God was the sovereign ruler over all. Psalm 47, verse 7, for the king is the king of all kings. Sing to him a, a psalm of praise. God reigns over all the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The Lord is king, Psalm 93. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Your reign, O Lord, is holy forever and ever. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. The Israelites understood who this God was. And some of the beauty of the creation account is it helped them understand how our God, Yahweh, was differentiated from the other gods of other nations, where these other gods actually created human beings for their own purpose and pleasure and slavery. Yahweh actually generously provides for humanity before the fall and then immediately after the fall, where the other gods of other nations were distant and unreachable, and you had to try to sacrifice your way into their hearing. Yahweh actually expressly created creation and humanity to be in relationship with us or with them where other gods were fickle and demanding and wanting you to earn things. God in His goodness gifts a good creation to humanity before we could ever earn a thing. This creation account actually portrays this beautiful first glimpse of a God that is totally different than the surrounding gods of the other nations. And as we work our th way through these six acts of the macro story, that picture of the beauty of God and who He is and how amazing He is, that's just going to get crisp, more and more crisp and clear and beautiful and amazing. Okay, lots more that we could dig into that we're not going to uh, because I want to move on to one last question. So let me just summarize chapter one or act one in the creation narrative. We could say this, while the kingdom of God is not explicitly spoken about in this first act of the story, the creation narrative presents God first as creator, and therefore as creator, He is king. He is the one true God. And therefore, He has this authority to delegate his oversight of the world to the humans who've been made in his image. And all of creation at this point is his kingdom, but specifically the earth where God and humanity will dwell together. This is the starting point of the great story. And it's important for us to know that because we know by three chapters, things are going to get screwed up pretty quickly. But it's important for us to know the beginning because here's a little teaser, because how it begins, this story, is exactly how it's going to end. But to conclude our time together, just for the next five or so minutes, I want to move away from this sort of theological assertion or this declaration, God is King, and I want to ask and bring this to a really important personal question, and that is, is God your king? Or we might want to ask ourselves, is God my king? Now, before we answer that question, it's important for us to note again that oftentimes how we as Canadians think about king and kingship is different than king and kingdom in the Bible and in the ancient Near East in particular. It can be tempting for us to place God is my king in the same sort of category as King Charles is my king. That is, I give mental assent to this, it's probably true in some way, shape, or form, and it doesn't really impact my life in any feasible way. That's not the biblical framework of king and kingdom. Nor is a constitutional monarchy which is what we would say Britain is, 
constitutional monarchy is when a nation has a monarchy, there's a king or a queen still, and there's some degree of power there, uh, lots of degree of symbolism and action, but there's a democratically elected government that really has the biggest impact on my life, and in this process, I, as a person, have a voice in determining who's going to lead us uh, in that government. That's democracy. And democracy can be great. We modern Christians in North America, we, we love it because we, we're pretty concerned about our individual rights. We, we like to have a say in things, and, and democracy at least gives us uh, uh, an opportunity for that. But the kings and kingdoms of the ancient Near East weren't democracies. They weren't constitutional monarchies. It was an absolute monarchy, is what it was. The king had total power as the head of the nation. There may have been other forms or heads of government to help this king rule the nation, but at the end of the day, it's the king that has complete and final authority. And in this kind of absolute monarchy, there were two types of people. There were only two types of people. There was a king or queen, and there was one of them, and then there were subjects, the rest of us. And we might have all sorts of human hierarchies within that, but the bottom line, in an absolute monarchy, in that kind of a kingdom, there's a king and there are subjects. That's it. And this is actually the framework out of which God as king and His kingdom emerges. And that just challenges us modern readers. That grates on our modern values of independence and autonomy and self-determination and us ultimately being the final authority. The humbling truth is that you and I want to be king. We've wanted to be king or queen since the very beginning. Or at the very least, we maybe could move to at least some sort of compromise where we can say, okay, you're my king, and I will follow the vast majority of the things that you say, but the things that I kind of struggle with or don't really like, I'm going to kind of do my own thing. That's, that's not kingship. That's not subject-ship. We can do that with King Charles. King Charles will eventually make a speech, and he's going to talk about some of the things that are important to him and the, the ways that the world or you know, the Western world or the Commonwealth should be doing X, Y, or Z. And we can listen to that, and we could say, that's very interesting, King Charles. I'm going to reflect on that, and I will determine whether that matters to me or not and how I may or may not shape my life. It's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Now, to be clear, God gives us agency. We can say yes or no to Him. We've got this free will. But God doesn't give us the option to say, God, you are my king. I want to be a part and a participant in your kingdom, and I will simultaneously continue to determine how best to live my life. This just isn't an option for us. And yet it is a temptation for every single one of us. So we can only say, you are my king, when we submit our thoughts, our will, our reactions, our preferences, our opinions, our future. We surrender those things. We surrender our whole selves, our lives, to His rule and reign. What that means is, and this is challenging, what that means is you may have a whole bunch of ideas about whether Christian community is worth the effort or not to engage in. You might have a bunch of opinions about whether that person is appropriate for you to marry or not. You might have thoughts or opinions about what you should be doing with your money and how much you should be giving away or what you should be doing with your disposable time after retirement. You could have all sorts of opinions and ideas and rationales and, and good logical reasons, but at the end of the day, if Jesus is king, those things are all secondary to what He wants for you and what He's asking of you. 
and where he leads you. Because he is king, and he is a good king. And so as subject, we in faith trust him enough to follow. Even if it's unclear, even if it's scary, even if it looks like it's leading to death, if it looks like it's leading to death in any kind of way, death of ego or even literal death, good news, you're probably writing the gospel because death always leads to life and a full life in His kingdom. Not always an easy life, don't ever get those two things confused, but full, meaningful, eternal. And so as we wrap up and as I invite the worship team to come back up here, let me just ask the question now again. Is Jesus your king? Yeah, we can say he is the king. I'm not asking that question. Is he your king? Or could it be that you and I, we've portioned off certain parts of our life. We've said, I'll rule this part. This relationship, this hurt, this situation, this bank account, this addiction. You know what, God, you can have parts of my life. You can even have most of my life. But just these ones. Uh, I'm going to keep those ones close. The truth is, all of us do this. At some point in the journey, we all do it. I do it. I've been thinking through this for the last month as I've been preparing for this series. The two verses of Scripture related to the kingdom are all about this point for my own life. Scott, am I your king or not? So I've asked the question, why don't we just take a moment now to invite the Spirit to ask and help us answer the question. Let's pray together. And King Jesus, we do invite you through the grace of your Spirit now to come and help us know our hearts. Reveal our subtle ways that we rebel against the kingdom and the king. Show us those blind areas that we haven't even yet noticed and where we've been knowingly and we're well aware of our actions of rebellion and doing what we want. I pray that in your kindness and your mercy, you would reveal yourself and your truth and you would call us back And where there's areas that we need to repent and we need to confess and we need to turn and go a different way, we're asking that you, King Jesus, would help us in these moments. For some of us, these are really important moments right now because we don't want to talk for the next few months about kingdom and the beauty of your kingdom and the beauty of the king and our participation and, and what we're working towards. If we don't get this part right, we're going to get everything else wrong to some degree. So come and speak to us, King Jesus, and give us courage to respond in whatever ways you're asking.
crucified and risen Savior, exalted Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, ruler of all creation. We lift you up in our hearts today, in our worship today. We ask you, King Jesus, may your kingdom come. May your will be done in our own lives, in our families' lives, in our relationships, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our city. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us. If, if you're processing something right now that you'd like to process with another person and you'd appreciate some prayer, there will be a few folks up at the front uh, available to pray with you at this time. And uh, as per normal, as we leave this place, we'd love for you parents to go get your children. That would be nice. And then we would love for you to hang around for a little bit and let's be church together. This was one part of what it means to be church. And now we have some moments outside of these doors to be church together with one another. God's grace and peace to you all.